So I've been reading a lot of uh, Gilles Deleuze lately. Um, most recently, this book, Difference and Repetition, that he wrote in 68, I believe, as part of his dissertation. And uh, I just started chapter two on repetition. And while I was reading it yesterday, um, an idea for a graphic uh, or a diagram came to me, which you can see here. Um, you know, it's, it was while I was reading about the the power of imagination, uh, and in particular the passive synthesis of imagination, and the way that it contracts the past into the present moment, into the lived present, um, and also um, opens us to the possibilities of a future yet to be determined. Um, and it opens us to the, to these future possibilities in the present. Like, and so imagination is constantly synthesizing habit and novelty, or what we've received and inherited from the past with what we um, feel might be in the future, with what we feel even should be in the future, what we, feel, what we may even feel responsible for bringing about in the future. Um, so the determinism of the past, right, or the, ter the determinateness of the past, and the freedom of the future, the open-endedness of the future, are brought together in this sort of um, pulsing presence of, you know, the living duration of our lives, the, uh, um, the place and time of our being and becoming. And Deleuze describes this first, you know, he, he, he tells us to imagine a point, and we, we, we can't help but represent at least the present moment, but as a point, as a sort of instantaneous moment, um, or comprehension of all things at that slice in the space-time loaf. And he thinks that this is a false notion of, of the present, because really the present is always in motion, in process. It's always repeating itself, but in a non-identical way. Um, it's coming into and out of existence rhythmically, uh, but each time different from the last because of some... Um, some recognition by a mind or a spirit or um, a contemplative soul to lose, uses Plotinus's language language for that. Um, there's some recognition and some uh, concrescence, maybe as Whitehead would say, that that brings past and future together in a coherent way, allowing habit and novelty to contract in a creative way. Um, and so the way we might draw this out, uh, I think it would look something like this. Um, so you have a sort of causal cone here of past and future, and then this wouldn't just be physical causal, but um, also you know, not just efficient causes, in other words, but the causal cones here articulated are physical from the past, but uh, conceptual into the future. So it's not efficient causation, but um, formal and final causation. Now, here in the center, right, we, we, you think we would start with just a point, but we realize then that the present moment is is a constantly repeating series of points, uh, which you see here, um, and then we realize that well, then if this series is constantly repeating, always though with a difference, with some non-identical change, making it non-identical, then there never was an instant to begin with. There there was more of an ever-present pulsation. Um, which wasn't, right, it wasn't in time as a series, but provided time, but that, uh, from which time emerged, uh, originally. 
So the living present is then, it's, it's in some way atemporal, uh, in that it gives rise, it's the condition for and gives rise to time. Um, and you'll also notice that there's kind of a fractal pattern um, to these lines of inheritance and, um, and to this graded hierarchy of eternal objects. Um, it's not a hierarchy like, like a tree growing sort of up in a vertical direction. It's more like a rhizome, as Deleuze and Guattari described it. Um, but it's, you know, in the future, the fractal branching uh, reaches out into these sets of relevant novelty, you know, relevant as given to the living present. So it, it's what Whitehead would call the graded, our own graded envisagement or desire for certain possibilities um, certain future eternal objects available to us given the way that the past, the actual occasions of the past have been contracted into the present um, that we've inherited from the past. So the, the fractal in the past then is, is more like these um, phylogenetic and um, you know, ontogenetic lines of, of lineage, of, of ancestry. Um, and Deleuze calls this cellular heredity. And you'll also notice that, you know, there are sort of two directions that each side of this diagram break off into, an upper and a lower. Um, on the side of the past here, uh, one goes up here into the macrocosm, one goes down here to the microcosm. And what I mean by this is that, uh, you know, the, the way we talk about an organism in an environment um, I'm always going to be more aware of my own organism than I am of the environment within which it is embedded. And that that's not to say, though, that if you go far enough back in time that my organism isn't made of the very elements composing the rest of my environment. And so that in that sense, I don't share a common ancestor with not only my, my biological um, incarnate form here, but my physical you know, the physical, physical constituents of this form um, uh, or I, I share with my environment. So I'm, I can't really be an organism separate from an environment. I'm a mode of that environment itself, come to a new mode of self-presence. Um, so ultimately, you know, these two directions leading into the past macrocosm and the past microcosm, um, they're going to they're gonna meet up, right, uh, out, out here, right? They're going to this fractal will will reconnect and become part of again the same branching um, pattern. But as we approach the living present, I think a tension is created between the apparent separation between organism and environment. The more that the organism, you know, involutes or or or, or you know spirals inward into these you know creating nervous systems and these branching neural patterns that. Uh, allow what's inside this body to react and even alter what's outside of it in such a way that it really does begin to to mirror, you know, the microcosm begins to internally mirror or recreate the macrocosm. It's as if a second nature is born at the heart of the first. Um, so... I think part of what I'm describing here is this this contractile power of imagination, as Deleuze describes it, that brings together micro and macrocosm uh, into this living present. And what we are is this rhythmic becoming of concrescent actual occasions, and in some sense we're dying in every moment and being resurrected in the, in the next with a change added with something novel um, now incarnate in us so yeah there's the diagram I would appreciate your comments I'm sorry I deleted the last video without answering some people's comments that were there I did read them and they, they have helped me think more about this and I'm hoping that you'll continue to help me find ways of articulating the the concept underlying this diagram. Um, 
in a way that's comprehensible both to myself and to others. So, yeah, I'd appreciate any feedback you might have. Thanks.